guys, welcome to a safe place to learn the good and the bad with Alicia. I'm Alicia and in my last video I talked about week one of my summer two Texas government class. We did introductions, read chapter one through three and ten in our textbook, Governing Texas, and took an exam on what we learned. I also covered chapter one in my last video. Um, chapter one was titled The Political Culture, People, and Economy of Texas. So in today's video, I'll be discussing chapter two, the Texas Constitution. The objectives for this chapter include being able to identify the main functions of state constitutions, describe the seven Texas constitutions and their role in Texas political life, and analyze the major provisions of the Texas constitutions today. The Texas Constitution is the legal framework that the government works within in Texas. The Texas Constitution is an immediate, has an immediate and enormous impact on the citizens' everyday lives, perhaps even more than the U.S. Constitution. Though there are similarities between the two constitutions, there are also big differences. Rights guaranteed in the Texas Constitution go way beyond those of the U.S. Constitution. This can be seen with Article 1 and its many sections that create a detailed list of rights. The Texas Constitution is very thorough compared to the U.S. Constitution. The length and detail of the Texas Constitution make the amendment process an important puzzle piece in the political process. In Texas, voter approval is necessary in order to, for proposed amendments to the Texas Constitution to go into effect. After passage, the Texas legislature presents the proposed changes to the voters for approval. The U.S. Constitution has been amended only 27 times since 1789, while the Texas Constitution has been amended 498 times as of 2017. What are the functions of a state constitution? A state constitution is the legal structure of a government which establishes its power and authority as well as the limits on that power. State constitutions establish political institutions and explain the source of their power and authority. They also delegate powers to particular institutions and individuals and define how those powers are to be used are responsible for the establishment of local governments, protect against the concentration of political power in one institution or individual, and define the limits of political power. The Texas Constitution draws heavily from the American Constitution, but like I said, there are important differences that distinguish the two, like the Supremacy Clause, the Necessary Proper Clause, uh, the drafters of the Texas Constitution, and the Constitution of Texas actually guarantees other rights not um, found in the U.S. Constitution. There are five key tenets that unite the Texas and American constitutional experience, including popular sovereignty, uh, separation of powers, checks and balances, individual rights and liberties, and federalism. The U.S. Constitution limits the federal government's power, reserving powers not listed to the states and to the people. However, the Supremacy Clause dictates that in matters of disagreement that the U.S. Constitution takes precedent over the Texas Constitution. The Necessary and Proper Clause in the U.S. Constitution allows Congress to write laws to carry out its listed powers. However, the drafters of the Texas Constitution have generally denied office holders grants of discretionary power like the Necessary and Proper Clause to accomplish their goals. Texas isn't created by the federal government only subject to its powers, while local governments are created by the state and its people. Texas's seven state constitutions were shaped by the historical political climate of the time, and each works to correct the shortcomings of its predecessor. The first of the constitutions was under the Mexican political regime prior to independence. One was when it was an independent republic, one was when it was a member of the Confederacy, and four were as a state of the United States. Each one reflects different national priorities, different issues of the time, and different values of the writers. The founding period of Texas was much longer than that of the United States, but it did reflect the U.S. founding. In 1821, Mexico was formally granted independence from Spain after a period of revolts that started in Guanajuato and spread across Mexico and into the Texas province. 
Texas operated under the National Mexican Constitution of 1824, making it the first of the seven Texas constitutions. It was modeled after the U.S. Constitution with three branches, checks and balances, and a bicameral le legislature, but local affairs remained independent of the central government, and in the Mexican Constitution, um, it differed from the U.S. Constitution in one big way. Catholicism was established as a state religion. The Mexican Constitution combined the state of Coahuila and the province of Texas to form Coahuila y Texas. Then, after more than two years of drafting, Texas published a constitution in March of 1827 when the state was divided into three legislative districts, each with representation in a unicameral legislature with 12 elected deputies, of which Texas, or now the District of Bear, only had two. The legislature had a wide range of powers. The executive branch was vested in a governor and a vice governor, and the judicial power was placed in the state courts. The Constitution promoted the principles of liberty, security, property, and equality, as well as supporting education, freedom of the press, and the reduction of slavery, and Catholicism was also established as a state religion. The end of the Mexican Constitution of 1824 and the State Constitution of 1827 led to the creation of a new constitution that relied more on American political and cultural values. The end was a fundamental step on a road to independence for Texas. Texas's break with Mexico was the culmination of a growing sense of discontent over Texas's place in the federal system and constitutional crisis. American settlers in Mexico demanded significant changes to the Constitution, specifically separate statehood, a more liberal immigration policy for people from the United States, and the establishment of English and Spanish-speaking primary schools. Conventions were held to discuss constitutional changes in 1832 and 1833. When Stephen F. Austin went to Mexico City to petition, he was in prison pushing Texas further towards rebellion. In 1835, Texas political leaders met at San Felipe and created a declaration that would serve as a prelude to the formal Texas Declaration of Independence that would come from the 1836 Constitutional Convention at Washington on the Brazos, where they declared independence from Mexican military and religious tyranny. Of the 59 delegates, two-thirds of the delegates were from southern slave states, six were from border states of Kentucky, seven were from northern states, three were from Mexico, including two that were born in Texas, and four were from English-speaking lands. All of these different people were able to come together and create a Declaration of Independence that reflected their shared interests and values. They sought to justify the separation from Mexico to create an independent republic, stating in the Declaration that Mexico's government had abdicated its duties and broken the trustee relationship that binds a people to those in authority. They presented a long list of grievances against the central government, including the failure to provide freedom of religion, a system of public education, and trial by jury, similar to the American Declaration of Independence. After declaring Texas a separate republic independent from Mexico, the convention drafted a new, brief, and flexible constitution establishing an elected chief executive bicameral legislature, a four-tiered court system, and included a Bill of Rights. The Constitution protected the institution of slavery, promoted the idea of community, property, and public education. It also included a process for amendments. The Texas population skyrocketed after 1836 since having slaves was now protected. In 1836, Texas had a population of 38,470 people, including 5,000 slaves, but by 1860 there were more than 182,566 slaves, making up more than 30% of the state's population. Texas remained an independent republic until 1845, when it joined the United States leading to the next constitution. 
1836 Constitution actually called for Texas to join the United States, but it didn't join for another nine years, stopped due to its intention to enter as a slave state and a fear of war with Mexico. In its annexation agreement with the United States, there were some special provisions. Texas was to give up all defense-related property, keep all public lands and public debts, and maintain its ability to split into four additional states. The last president of the Republic of Texas, Anson Jones, called a convention on July 4, 1845 to draft the state's new constitution. The new constitution drew on the 1836 constitution, maintaining separation of powers, checks and balances, a bicameral legislature, elected executive, a tiered court system, promotion of education and community property, and an amendment process. The legislature now consisted of the House of Representatives and the Senate. The House would have between 45 and 90 members elected for two-year terms, and the Senate would have between 19 and 33 members elected for four-year terms, with half of the Senate being elected every two years. Revenue bills would have to originate in the House. They established a public school system and set aside land to support a permanent school fund. They were granted the authority to select the state treasurer and comptroller in a joint session. The governor and the lieutenant governor would be elected with the governor's term set to two years and only being able to serve for four years within any six years. Governors were given the power to convene and adjourn the legislature to veto legislation, which could be overturned by a two-thirds vote of each house of the legislature, and to grant pardons and reprieves to command the state militia, and to appoint the Attorney General, Secretary of State, and the District Supreme Court judges, subject to the approval of the Senate. The judicial branch consisted of a Supreme Court with three judges, district courts, and lower courts deemed necessary by the legislature. Judges on the higher courts served for six-year terms and could be removed from office with a two-thirds vote of each house. Amending the Constitution was difficult once being proposed by a two-thirds vote of each house, the amendment then needed to be approved by a majority of the voters and then by another two-thirds vote of each house in the next legislature. Only one amendment ever passed in 1850, a provision that was added for the election of the state officials who were originally appointed by the governor or by the legislature. By 1860, slavery was concentrated in East Texas and along the Gulf Coast and had become important to the Texas economy. However, in large sections of the state, especially in the North and West, slavery was virtually non-existent due to the different economy. The decision to secede over the issue of slavery after the election of Lincoln was a contentious one, dividing Texas along regional, ethnic, and partisan lines. A special convention convened in 1861 to consider secession was dominated by lawyers and slaveholders. Lawyers made up 40% of the delegates, while slaveholders made up 70% of the delegates. The convention produced the Texas Ordinance of Secession, which reflected its pro-slavery membership and proclaimed that the northern states had broken faith with Texas and that northerners had violated the laws and constitution of the Federal Union by appealing to a higher law that trampled on the rights of Texans. Voters, who at this time were still all white males, approved secession in February of 1861. Minor changes were made to the existing constitution. President Johnson's presidential re reconstruction allowed for many former secessionists to vote, resulting in the convention being dominated by former secessionists. The convention delegates barely rejected the right to secession, accepted the war debts incurred by the state, and surrendered to the abolition of slavery. Male free freed slaves were granted fundamental rights to their persons and property, to sue and to be sued, and to contract with others, but they couldn't vote or hold public office. 
Most other things from the Constitution of 1861 remain the same except for some salary increases, term limits were extended, um, the governor was granted line item veto power on appropriations, and the courts expanded. Black codes which limited social, political, and economic status of African Americans in Texas were passed after the first legislature was elected, proving the fears of many unionists. In response, radical Republicans in Washington passed the Congressional Reconstruction Acts of 1867. Radical Republicans in Congress viewed the attempts at reintegrating Texas as a failure as both Texas and Louisiana were still under military occupation. So they dismissed most of the elected officials and called for a new constitutional convention. Former secessionists were banned from voting and holding office, leading to the landslide win by radical Republicans. Of the 90 delegates at the convention, only six had served in the previous constitutional convention, and 10 were African Americans, a huge difference from the previous conventions. The Constitution was published under military orders without a vote from the citizens. African Americans were granted full citizenship and U.S. Constitution was deemed uh, supreme law of the land. The 14th Amendment guaranteed the privileges and immunities of citizens, due process privileges, um, and equal protection under the law. The Constitution also altered the relationship among the three branches of government. The House of Representatives was set to 90 and the Senate was set to 30 members. Terms changed and the powers of the governor expanded, which newly elected radical Republican Governor Edmund Davis used to maintain his rule. The courts reduced and salaries were increased again. But what about the Constitution from 1861? Did Texas leave the Union? Are the laws passed under the legislature at this time legal? The U.S. Supreme Court decided in the Texas v. White case of 1869 that Texas had never left the Union and that the Ordinance of Secession of 1861 and all of its acts of legislature during that time were considered to be null. In 1872, Democrats regained control of the state government and Richard Koch was elected governor. Davis tried to keep control over the governor's office by having his hand-picked Supreme Court invalidate the election. He surrounded himself with state police at the Capitol, but when Democrats managed to slip past the guards and gather to organize, and Davis wasn't able to get federal troops to back him, he finally had to leave the office and surrender. The final phase of Texas's founding began with the passage of the Constitution of 1876. In 1875, a new constitutional convention was called with delegates selected by the popular vote, 40 of which were members of Grange. I mentioned them in chapter one. Um, 75 of the delegates were white Democrats, nine were white Republicans, and six were African American. 40 of them were farmers and members of the Grange, a militant farmers movement of the late 19th century that fought to improve conditions for farmers. The Constitution of 1876 is still the basis of Texas's government today. It was detailed and limited the powers of the state government. The framers committed to four major themes, strong popular control of the state government, limited state government power, economy in government, and agricultural interest. The new limits on government were in reaction to the state's experience with Governor Davis. The framers expanded the number of elected offices within the executive and judiciary, still subject to control by a white male electorate. They diffused executive powers among several offices and created a part-time legislature. They limited government debt and power to tax, limited official salaries and decentralized public education. And remember, many of them were farmers and members of the Grange who added provisions protecting homesteads and regulating railroads and banks. Changes could not be made as easily as they previously were to help prevent another radical Republican or Governor Davis takeover. 
The U.S. Constitution is brief and flexible with only seven articles and 27 amendments. Texas, on the other hand, has a long and detailed art constitution with 16 articles and almost 500 amendments. The Texas Constitution covers many policy areas the U.S. Constitution leaves to legislative action, resulting in the Texas Constitution's overarching theme of limited government written to prevent the expansion of government authority. Framers created additional checks and balances by incorporating these policies, making it difficult for governors to exercise power effectively, giving special interest groups a place where they could promote and project their own agendas, even when there's political opposition. The two constitutions are so different because the framers of the U.S. Constitution and of the Texas Constitution had different goals. The U.S. Constitution was written to overcome the liabilities of the Articles of Confederation and create a government that could act effectively in the interest of public welfare in a variety of policy areas, while the Texas Constitution was written to prevent the expansion of government authority and return to a system of political power that was perceived as acting against the interest of the people. Humbly invoking the blessings of Almighty God, the people of the state of Texas do ordain and establish this constitution. There is a theme of limited government and a list of guaranteed rights, many reflecting those in the U.S. Constitution, but it also goes way beyond that, including the rights to uh, Republican government, ensuring the power of the people, and that the people of Texas always have the inalienable right to alter, reform, or abolish their government in any way they see fit. It continues with public policy concerns, including the right to access public beaches and the rights of crime victims. Article 2 is a super short article, roughly one paragraph that reinforces the concept of separation of powers and the three branches. Article 3 is the longest of the articles, making, almost, making up almost a third of the original constitution. The article calls for a bicameral legislature split into the House and the Senate. 150 House members and 31 Senate members, and a limited term with limited terms to two years for the House and four years for the Senate. The article also includes stipulations on who can become a member of the legislature and provides the details for the selection process of and legislative proceedings. Salaries are finally limited and legislature is subject to oversight from the executive branch, including the Comptroller of Public Accounts and a bipartisan Texas Ethics Commission that was created to recommend salary increases for members of the legislature and to set per diem rates for legislators and the lieutenant governor, among other things. Most of Article 3 focuses on a variety of public concerns, including lotteries and various boards. Article 4 spreads power across the plural executive to include the governor, lieutenant governor, secretary of state, who is appointed by the governor with the consent of the Senate, comptroller of public accounts, commissioner of the general land office, and the attorney general. Besides the Secretary of State, all of the other offices are elected by voters every four years. Independently elected offices guarantee that any one person's power will be limited, providing additional checks and balances. Unlike the U.S. Constitution, Article 5 provides for a dual Supreme Courts and several lower courts. The two Supreme Courts consist of the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals and the Texas Supreme Court for Civil Cases. Article 5 includes discussion on particular issues involving lower courts and details that the requirement for judicial service and potential vacancies on the court. Unlike federal judges, state judges in Texas are elected. Nine Supreme Courts and nine Court of Criminal Appeals judges are elected at large in the state, and lower court judges are elected by voters in their respective geographic locations. The Texas Constitution seeks an independent judiciary that is checked by the power of the people through elections and can also check and balance the other two branches. Article 6 details who may vote in Texas and how elections and voter registration are conducted. Article 7 created a state board of education and establishes the funds for the University of Texas and Texas A&M universities, among other schools. 
An effective system of free public schools is deemed necessary to promote a Republican form of government and requires Texas to support, maintain, and fund an efficient system of public schools. Article 8 is a highly controversial section centering on income tax. Again, limiting the power of legislature, this article restrains the power to tax business and income by subjecting it to a voter approval and dedicating it, the funds to education and tax relief. Article 9 and 11 is, are highly detailed articles discussing the creation, organization, and operation of county and municipal governments. Articles 10, 12, 13, and 14 are heavily revised articles uh, with specific topics such as railroads in Article 10, private corporations in Article 12, Spanish and Mexican land titles in Article 13, and public land in Article 14. Article 15 covers impeachment. Impeachment is one of the biggest checks Congress holds against the other branches. It provides the House the power to impeach and the Senate the power to try. Uh, the Senate has the power to try the governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, land office commissioner, uh, comptroller, Supreme Court, Court of Appeals, and district court judges. The governor is empowered to appoint a person to fill the vacancy until the decision on impeachment impeachment is reached, the House and Senate and the courts decide what constitutes as an impeachable offense, and the Supreme Court has original jurisdiction to hear and determine if the district court judges are competent to discharge their judicial duties. The governor may also remove judges of the Supreme Court, Court of Appeals, and district courts when requested by two-thirds vote of both the House and the Senate. With the advice and consent of two-thirds of the members of the Senate present, a governor may also remove an appointed, appointed public official. Article 16 is a super long catch-all article tackling a variety of issues ranging from official oaths of office to community property to banking corporations and stock laws to the election of the Texas Railroad Commission to the state retirement system. Really just a huge variety of issues. Article 17 details the fourth stage process of amending the Constitution, um, including proposal by the legislature, approval by two-thirds of the members of both the House and the Senate, twice published in recognized newspapers, and approval by a majority of the state's voters. Demands for amending the Constitution have intensified in recent years as legislators deal with the problem of making changes in public policy due to the difficulty of making amendments. Following a heated election in 1972, new members of the legislature were empowered to sit as a constitutional convention. In 1979, there was a drive to rewrite the Texas Constitution that grew from stock fraud in the early 1970s involving the Sharpstown State Bank and the National Bankers Life Insurance Company. Following the 1970s election, a suit filed in Dallas Federal Court by the Federal Securities and Exchange Commission alleged that a number of influential Democrats had been bribed. The resulting convictions created a throw the rascals out mentality in the 1972 election inspiring special interest groups to mobilize and derail efforts to rewrite the constitution. The convention met in January 1974 in Austin and was originally scheduled to last 90 days. These 90 days were then extended to 150 days, but without be enough time and being hounded by the bitter politics and special interest groups, the convention failed to reach an agreement by three votes. Though a new constitution didn't pass, at the next session of the legislature, eight, amend eight amendments were passed, which basically rewrote the constitution. Unfortunately, they were all turned down in November 1975 special election. There are two likely reasons for the low voter turnout in constitutional amendment elections. Constitutional amendment elections are usually held in off years when there are no elections with candidates on the ballot and many of the amendments are relatively insignificant to most 
voters and a lot of the time they're controversial. Between 2001 and 2010, 77 of the 79 proposed amendments were approved. In 2017, seven amendments were proposed. All seven passed, even though less than 6% of the registered voters voted. Down more than 5% in just two years. If only 6% of the population is voting, can you really say that the vote is reflective of the people? In this chapter, we reviewed the founding of Texas and how the constitutional government has evolved in Texas. We learned that there has been a total of seven constitutions in Texas and compared them to the U.S. Constitution. It's been almost 45 years since there were any serious attempts to modify the Texas Constitution aside from the many long detailed amendments to deal with uh, technical problems. Because of the limits on the legislature making rewriting the Constitution a difficult task, amendments are more likely to be added. While more amendments are likely to be added, voter turnout is likely to remain low unless there's a highly controversial amendment on the ballot. Even though there has been dis diminishing interest in constitutional amendment elections, the Texas Constitution continues reflecting the values, goals, and the people of Texas and our political system. The chapter objectives I mentioned earlier included being able to identify the main functions of state constitutions, describe the seven Texas constitutions and their role in Texas political life, and analyze the major provisions of the Texas Constitution today. What are the main functions of a state constitution? The state's constitution is the governing document of the state that sets up the framework for the state as a whole. Lots of the same ideas from the U.S. Constitution are in the Texas Constitution, like Republican government, separation of powers, checks and balances, and individual rights. Describe the seven Texas constitutions and their role in Texas political life. Texas's constitution have reflected the concerns of the times in which they were written. The Civil War and Reconstruction played a huge role in molding Texans' attitudes towards the dangers of strong state government. The Constitution of 1876 wanted to limit the powers held by Governor Davis under the previous Constitution. Though there have been many amendments to the Constitution of 1876, it remains our current Texas Constitution. Analyze the major provisions of the Texas Constitution today. The Texas Constitution is composed of 16 articles, since one of the original 17 articles has been deleted. The articles lay out the complex structure of power that defined government in Texas. So that wraps up this chapter. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you learned something new. Please feel free to reach out to me in the comments uh, below. I'd really love to hear what you've got to say. And remember to like and subscribe. I'll see you soon. Thank you.